very glad to be here this morning. If, uh, if you take your hymnals and stand, we're going to start by singing number 342. Number 342, Jesus Saves. Turn over to number 335. Number 335.
each of you. You may be seated. What a joy to be here together today. Certainly no greater thing that we could sing or talk about than the fact that Jesus saves, as we started out with this morning. And, uh, and certainly, if, if we know him, then we should be thrilled to proclaim it, to speak about that all the day long, as this song says. Um, I hope that's the case in your life. What a joy to be able to share this time together this morning. Uh, we very much look forward to the week that's ahead. A lot of preparation has gone into it. I thank you very much to all of the church folks that have put in a lot of effort in preparing for the activities of the week that lie ahead. And particularly, we look forward to the time um, of just bonding together as a church, building intimacy amongst the membership, and sharing together in God's word. And so be, be prepared for that. Um, we're going to finish up our, our normal morning worship service um, upon the completion of the preaching, then that'll be it for our activities on this property today, and then folks will have a few hours to get changed, get your stuff, and get prepared, and then um, check-in time out at Bingle Camp is at 3.30 this afternoon for the lion's share of the church membership. And so, again, a lot of muscle movement, moving things out there and getting set up. And appreciate those that are going to be so much of a help with that. But we look forward to that time. And, uh, and this morning, we're very much looking forward to the opportunity to continue singing and then, uh, and then to hear the preaching of God's word. At this time, um, we're going to go before the Lord in prayer as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings. And it's always our prayer that the Lord will find us joyful givers as we contribute to his cause. Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the beauty of the day. Uh, being able to rise this morning and have our being is a gift from you. We know that none of us are guaranteed another day of life. I pray that we would all feel the urgency of that reality, understanding how short life is, whether we live to an old age or whether we, uh, or whether we die young. We know that it's over very quickly and we need to be prepared. And so I pray that every soul would be uh, expectant to hear from you this morning and that you would be able to meet the need of each life as we submit ourselves to you and your holy word we give you thanks for your care for us your love for us for drawing us here together today and again just for the beauty of the the clear day and the sunshine and as i reflect on on the the physical reality of that i'm always reminded of uh, of the spiritual nature of how your light of truth shines into our hearts and and how it's shown into mine and led me to salvation through Christ. I pray that every heart would be humbled before you today. And now as we prepare to take up this offering, it is our prayer that um, that as your people give, as your people tithe, that you would take what's um, what's given and that you would multiply it so that uh, your ministry may continue and thrive both here and abroad. And we give you thanks that we're blessed with gainful employment and with the resources that you've provided so that we can return them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take our hymnals and turn to number 102. Number 102. <laughs> Hey. 
have you stand one more time if you would. We're going to take our hymnals and go to number 375. Number 375. Well, what a wonderful morning um, together so far. I really enjoyed the opportunity just to hear uh, a bit of the, the ministry opportunities and philosophy over the past hour, and I hope that you enjoyed that as well. I mentioned earlier that uh, for me personally, I've known Brother Dennis Thomas for a long time, or at least known of him. I met him when I was uh, a young man. I was about 17 years old the first time that I met him. I believe that was his second trip to Alaska. Yeah, this is his third one, but that was back in the, the mid to late 90s, and uh, really, really uh, an impact on my life at that point in time, which he may or may not even know about, but I've been amazed just in visiting with him and with some of these other men over the past week to see the way that many of the, the threads of our lives and of our heritage are woven together. Um, many of the, the folks that are very dear friends to him, folks like Brother Gary Hampton, who um, who planted a church up here, and, and ultimately I was raised in and trained in, and then, uh, and then some other folks that, uh, that he knew and many of us know well, such as Brian Disney that was, uh, came to the Lord there at, at Rogers Baptist Church. He was telling me about that just a couple of days ago and the impact he's had on my life and, of course, on the life of Brother Cristobal and, uh, and many others that we've known and supported through the years. Just amazing for me to see. Uh, we, we considered a couple of Wednesday nights ago about 
um, the generational impact that we can have, either in iniquity as parents, whether it's physical or spiritual parents, and the way that those consequences are passed down through the years and through the generations, or the positive reality uh, and impact that there can be when people serve the Lord and they minister for him and many other generations are blessed as a result. I'm a, personally a product of that. I'm so thankful for it. It was actually um, the last time Brother Thomas was up here that the Lord really put his finger on my heart and uh, humbled me, brought me to my knees and brought me to a point of full surrender. I still remember to this day even the text that he was preaching out of. I don't remember a whole lot. My memory's not very good, but I still remember the text that, that the Lord led him to preach and uh, and really just brought me to a point of full surrender. And again, so I'm just thankful for that. It's been exciting to, um, to look forward to him coming up here and his wife and, of course, these other missionaries as well. Now, we heard about the, uh, the missionary strategy and work that he's utilizing tomorrow evening out at the church camp. We're going to hear from Brother Cristobal, and he's going to share with us as well so that we have an update. And, you know, we just want to be intimately connected with the missionaries we're partnered with. We want to be able to pray effectively and give effectively and go and, and help. And so I'm so glad for the opportunity to hear from them in person. It's a rare treat for us here in Alaska. With all that said, um, one of the things that um, I always listen for little phrases that I can pick up on or things that I can learn from these guys. And one of the things I've heard Brother Thomas reflect on over the past couple of days as we visited, even just looking back at some of these um, uh, mentors in the faith and, and other men of God that were so faithful is that there are no great men. There's just a great God, right? And, and so I'm thankful for that. We're not uh, ever desirous of lifting up or elevating or glorifying a, a man, but Paul did say, follow me as I follow Christ. And so I'm thankful for men in the ministry that I can look to and that have impacted my life. Um, we certainly look forward to hearing from God's word this morning from the Lord. Brother Thomas is going to come and preach for us today. And as always, I would ask you, please uh, give your full reverent attention to God's word this morning. Let the Lord deal with you and speak to your heart. Be submitted to him right from the outset so that he's able to do what he wants in your life today. Brother Thomas, would you come please and preach for us? It's always so awkward to walk up there like this, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know that I like sitting up there all the time either, you know. I've been in church where I sit up on the podium the whole time. People can tell whether I'm singing like I ought to. <laughs> I'm going to try it in the pulpit. I, I'm so thankful for Brother Phil. Boy, you can tell how tender-hearted he is. It's reflected in the church members and and uh, all your care for us. And it's it's and then and then you can tell the order. God is a God of order, amen, and he's glorified in that. Sister Jean, I didn't know you could tickle those ivories like that, girl. Man, oh man, we got some talent in the church. I love all of you, I mean it. Every day I get on the radio, I tell people I love them. I tell them I love you, Daddy. I love you, Mama. I love you, Granddaddy. I love you, Grandmama. I love you, all your babies. I love all of you, and I say that on the radio. And by the way, I'm not on Christian radio. I'm on public radio, uh, you know, and it's, it, it really is a target for me to reach people before it's eternally too late. Amen? So I'm going to try this. Get up in this pulpit. Does that sound good? Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts. Now, I'm going to read several texts. I'm not preaching from one text this morning. Um, Acts chapter 13, verse 22. The idea today um, was that having a heart for missions. And um, I think of it as having a heart for the mission. And so, you know, it's the heart. 
takes the heart. If, the God, if God has our heart, he can guide us. The Lord has really blessed me. I'm not boasting in the flesh. I'm not boasting in the flesh, but he's given me courage. And uh, young men, God will give you courage. Young women, sisters in Christ, you seek God and you trust God and he will give you courage in these last days. Courage and especially courage to share the gospel with other men. But if God has your heart, you know, God's looking for people after his own heart. It says this in, in Acts chapter Acts chapter 13, verse 22. He says here that, you know, Saul had messed up and uh, God had to replace him. I don't want to be replaced. I'm telling you. I don't want anybody taking my place. I've, I've, I, I cherish my relationship with the Lord. But we're going to read here. And we're going to look at several texts this morning. Let's go to God in prayer and ask God to take the words that are said and help me to say the right word or God would oil it down with his powerful spirit of God and bless and may it, may it reach into the heart. I don't doubt it, not one bit, that in this congregation this morning, that there are those who God doesn't have your heart. You say, what does he want from me? Well, first of all, he wants you to trust him as your Savior and Lord. Amen. That's what he wants. And so he wants, he's, he may be speaking. And if God starts speaking to the heart, he won't quit. He won't stop. Maybe there are those who God has called into a, a fuller commitment to service. And he won't stop till he gets it. Father in heaven, I want you to be, I want you to have control of my heart. I want you to control my deepest emotional desires that you control, oh Lord, my intellect, the essence of my soul, which is my heart, that it would be yours, oh God. It would be meditating upon thee both day and night, oh God, and that you would guide me and that you'd give me all that I need to do what you want done, Lord. Bless now this message, and uh, as a man, it didn't seem much. As the Word of God, I know it's the all-powerful, skillful sword of the Spirit. But you, Lord, oh God, be our pastor. May we say, in reference to thee, no man ever spake as this man. So I pray, Father, that you would bless this day, bless this service. Thank you for this church and their commitment to thee, O Lord. For it's in Christ's way, name I pray, amen. It says here, and uh, Saul, you know, he messed up. He wouldn't obey God. And it says this in verse 22, and when he was removed, Saul, King Saul, he stood head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. He was the specimen of a leader, but he wasn't a leader. He didn't fear God. He didn't obey God. He didn't listen to God. But he was all those other things. 
He said, he raised, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto him, unto them, David, to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David. And he knows your name. He knows my name. One day he said, I have found Dennis. I have found Dennis. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Oh, God, help us to do that. Help us to fulfill his will. When I think about missions, the text that we would immediately want to look at would be Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. 16, 15. I want to emphasize that when Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's exactly what he meant. You can't save a soul. I can't save a soul. Anybody here can save a soul? Can you ever convince in the work of the Holy Spirit, can you ever convince someone that they're lost and convince them that they need to trust Christ? Can you do that? Well, I can't do that. You can, uh, one of the dearest friends uh, uh, ever in the ministry, his name is Charles Ashcraft. He's already been mentioned uh, already among us guys. But uh, he said this, convince, convince a man against his will and he'll be of that opinion still. So it's, it, we're not in the business of convincing men we're in the business of presenting the word and let God do the rest. Amen? And he will do the rest. But we are told here in chapter 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, meaning person, every living person. And, and the, what's scary about that is that you have to do it Generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. People now are dying. They don't have no chance. Don't have, they don't have no chance. Nobody got to them. We got, we've got to get, we must obey Christ in, in, in this, the purest intent. I'm telling you, the very, very, very purest intent of a newborn child of God is to so, tell somebody else. We see it all through the scriptures. I mean, we see it in the, we see it in the book of and we see it in the book of John, and when Jesus went forth and and then uh, called him forth disciples, and you can see this for yourself. Uh, and uh, but he he called uh, these people. John chapter one verse forty one. But this this is what happens when you when you get saved. You want you want to share this with people that you love. You want to. You want others that you love to have this peace that passes all understanding. But he says here in John chapter 1, verse 41, it says, He first, he first, it says in verse 40, and one of the two which heard John speak, followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he says, He first findeth his own own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, which is the Christ, the anointed one. We, we, he's, the one uh, he's the one we've been looking for. We, we found him. He's here. Come and see. Come and see the Savior and know him uh, in your heart. You know, uh, I've, it's amazing in the book of Luke, Luke, John, right before John, you know, in this uh, account in the Bible, in this account in the Bible, chapter 16, 
and verse 27. This is a very unusual insight uh, into a person who has died and has gone to hell. Uh, this is Lazarus and the rich man. And, and, you know, Lazarus, he laid, you know, with a broken body. The dogs would come and lick his sores. And he, he, uh, he lay there and the rich man had no compassion for him. And yet the rich man died. And he went to hell. Unprepared to meet God. So in chapter 16, most amazing text, and verse 27, and he says here, this is the rich man in hell, being in torment, he said, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, speaking of Lazarus, send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So not only do Christians, but those who have gone on before, they, they realize how badly they have messed up, but they want their family members not to come to this place. They want them to be saved and, and, and to avoid this and follow the example of Lazarus. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 20, You know, uh, this work of evangelism is a, it's a work of the heart. You know, I've said many times, Jolene and I, we left the state, we left our home church, and we went forth. We went to where the choir doesn't sing, you know. There's no pastors near to have fellowship with and there's no fellow believers and there's no communion in Christ outside of our own personal family to the uttermost. And I know that Jeremiah got to this place in chapter 20. Many missionaries get discouraged and come home. I, I would say most of them, either the hardship on life or the family. Many difficulties there. Many dangers there. there we went to a place where there were people being killed in the streets. Communism over... Uh, control of the United Fruit Company and uh, it was a very dark place a very very dark place for my family for my little kids and so and so and, and in those circles and you know not only me but there are missionaries who have gone out around the world. Maybe you this morning have, have thought, God, you've had times in, in your life when you were closer to the Lord or when you were more involved in, in this business of spreading the, the gospel. Jeremiah got to this place. I mean, he was, he was at a low time. And he says in verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my what? Heart. It's all about the heart. You got a heart. You got a heart for your wife? 
got a heart for your children. It's the most special part of God's creative work in mankind is he gave us a heart. The center of our desires and emotions and the things we care about. It's a tender, it can be a really tender place. It is in my. I'm always at the point of tears. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, they say. He said he came to a point that he was so down and so discouraged. He said, I'm, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna speak anymore in his name. But his word was in my heart as a what? A burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. So he could not stay there. He had to come forth and speak uh, the gospel, speak the truth of Israel and the, and the damnation that they were were facing Judah and, and what, the, what was prophesied in them. The mission is to the whole world. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, now, one might think, well, you know, there's a, there's a town over here. We, they don't have a church. Chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. He said, they don't have a church and, you know, they need a church and we'll go, we'll go start a church over there. But Jesus went to a, a town. He went to a town. And nobody believed. In fact, he couldn't do any miracles. Jesus himself could not do any miracles in that town. And he taught his disciples. He had to go away because there was no faith, he said. <clears throat> the disciples were taught the, the practice of foot dusting, dusting the dust off your feet. So every, you say, well, Oh, what a beautiful town. They really, really need a church, and they really do. But first you go into that town and you begin to preach the gospel and sow the seed. Amen? You begin to witness, and as you witness, God will open doors, or maybe he won't open doors. You know, Apostle Paul went to many a place, and they took him to town and stoned him there and left him for dead. You know, that happens too. But you see, the gospel is to be preached to every creature. You say, I went to a, a meeting. We went into Nicaragua. We didn't know anybody. You know, we were in buying groceries one Saturday. and we, I mean, we'd just been there days. And um, they invited us to a gathering of NGOs for church. And so we went over there. And later on, they had a symposium. They had uh, classes and and uh, on how to reach Nicaragua for Christ. And they went around and went around and went around and got everybody's opinion. And how, how do you know where to start a church? And fi I didn't say anything. Finally, they got to me and said, Dennis, how do you know whether you can start a church or not? And I said, well, that's easy. If nobody gets saved, there's not going to be a church there today. That don't mean tomorrow. That don't mean a year from now. That just means right now there's not going to be any church built right here because nobody is repenting and believing and opening their hearts to the gospel. Am I getting through? But you know, how do you know? Here you go. How do you know? How do you know if that... How do you know if that uh, sheep, that doll sheep, you saw him go behind that rock? How do you know? How do you know? If he's going to walk out and you get a clear shot, amen? 
How do, I'm a fisherman. How do you know where the fish are biting? Well, you got to go. It didn't, it's not called catching. It's called fishing. Amen? And so it's the same in the gospel. We've got to get the seed out. We have to go. And you don't know till you go. That's the bottom line. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, very amazing text. Chapter 2. Verses 12 through 16. Furthermore, when I come to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Now, that's what you're hoping for. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence to Macedonia. Now, thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place every place for we are unto God a sweet we are for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ to them that are saved and what does it say what does it say? To them that perish. We are a sweet savor both to them and to those that perish. To one, to the one we are the savor of death unto death. Tough, isn't it? Isn't it tough? Tough to read that, isn't it? And to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? I'm not. I don't know. But I know one thing. I have been taught and told and commanded to go preach the gospel to everyone in the world. Amen? I don't know what God's call might be for you. This is his will for me. But I know one thing. I have got to do. I am constrained by the Spirit of God to do everything within my power to reach everybody I possibly can. And I realize that many are not. The Bible says about the way, he says, broad is the way that leadeth to what? Destruction. But you know, they need the gospel too. Whether they receive it or they reject it, we are commanded to preach the gospel to everyone. And then we're to baptize. When there are believers, this is where Matthew chapter 28, verses, uh, you know, 20, 18 through 20, make disciples, he says, baptizing them and then teaching them to be all things. Well, you're not going to do that until they've been saved and they're not going to be saved and some, somebody goes and somebody tells them and they have an opportunity to receive or reject the word of God. Amen? It's like this morning. You said, I've not trusted Christ as my Savior. Well, now is the time. And not only that, but when you find believers, you're supposed to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen? And then he says to teach them the all things. That, look with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. This, this is the essence of who I am. This is the essence of what I do. Acts chapter 20. Now he's teaching, he's talking to the people 
at Ephesus. The brethren at Ephesus. You know, uh, in our radio outreach, of course, that's not all I do. I mean, I teach, I will share with you this week, uh, but I teach uh, a chart from Genesis, uh, in Genesis 1 1, actually before Genesis 1 1, uh, not really, but back long before the foundation of the earth and then all the way through to his second coming. And I teach that to men. So I have men who I, I gather with as pastors and, and teach them during the week. But I want them to be fully equipped. The Bible says in Acts chapter, uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, now, he's talking to the church at Ephesus. And then in verses 26, 27, 26 through 28, really. But he says here, listen to this. He says, how I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. I remember when I first started pastoring, I would... I would keep, it, keep a little journal, and uh, then I would keep a chart, keep a chart on all that I was teaching uh, the church so that I would make sure that they got everything they needed. So I wouldn't be leaving anything out. So I wouldn't be falling or standing on a soapbox somewhere. I want them to have the whole truth, God's whole truth, the whole needed for spiritual growth. It says, how I kept back nothing that was profitable for you, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house. He said, not only taught you, but hey, I took you and I showed you how to go about doing this, how to witness to people. How to, and all you're doing when you're witnessing, you know what you're doing? You're loving people. You're getting to know them and you're loving people. I don't, I don't, win, I don't win primarily people I don't know to Christ, but I would win people that I have entered in a relationship with. And so we find here that he says, I, I didn't keep them, nothing I kept. We went house to house, testifying both to the Jew and also to the Greek, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 26 it says, and therefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not, what, shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, to yourself and, 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 and to the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made you an overseer to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. And so here we find that, that but, but the emphasis I want to make this morning is that, man, we're supposed to do this to everybody. Everybody. We're, we're supposed to share this good news with everybody and ask God to give us courage to go. It's what he did. He took them in house to house, showed them how to tell others about Christ. The question is, what does God want to say and do in our hearts? You know, he wants to convince us. He wants to convince us. And he wants to woo us. I never forget back years ago, I, I was, uh, I'd seen Joe Lane at one of those SAT tests or, or whatever they called them. And uh, I saw the back of her hair, uh, her head, just so well groomed. <clears throat> so I, she left, and I, I couldn't find her, and I, so I just called her up on the telephone. I said, um, "I want to meet you." I said, "We pass each other in the hallway at a certain point, at a certain time. You know, we had our schedules." And I said. Um, 
I'm going to have on my tiger tooth check pants. So I walked by and she walked by and she looked down at my pants, looked at me. Wasn't anything there she was interested in. <laughs> well, finally called her up and I, I got a date and, and uh, Finally, I, of course, both of our, us were workers. We would work all, 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 all week long. We'd get out of school early and we'd go to work. And that's what we did. I, on Valentine's Day, I, what a dummy I am. But I, I spent a week's salary on a dozen red roses and had them delivered to her. And she went out with the guy that delivered the roses. <laughs> Years passed, went by, and I sent her another dozen red roses, but I delivered them myself. <laughs> what I want to emphasize this morning is this, is that the Lord wants our heart. If you give him your heart, he, he's not going to go, he's not going to do you wrong. He's a loving God, a tender God. He's, gonna, he's, he's not going to, you see, if God's calling you in the ministry, he's not going to, he's not going to abandon you and, and, and cause, your, cause hurt to your family by redirecting your life. He's not going to do that. Oh, we've had some pretty lean days, haven't we, baby? You know, he never abandoned us, ever. He's blessed us and prospered us and, and took care of us. You see, you say, well, I, you know, my, my family, and we've seen it, my family is not of this faith. And if they find out that I've been saved and baptized, they're going to ostracize me. That may happen. But you know, God wants your heart. And if he has your heart, like King David, he's, he's a man after God's own heart. And that's who I want to be. What is God speaking to your heart about this morning? Is he speaking to you about salvation? You know, in the book of Romans... Chapter 10. And verse 10. Well, first of all, in verse 1. Look at this missionary's heart. Look at this missionary's heart. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be what? Saved. There's no peace for your family, your extended family. There's no joy until Christ comes in. The desire to see your family saved, you can read the book of Romans and the, and the last chapter, you can read how that maybe his mother and even other family members were in Christ before he was saved. They were praying for him the whole time. He was a radical man. He was killing Christians and committing them to prison. I mean, he was a radical, but God got a hold of his heart. But we find in verse 10, he says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. And it says in verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be, what? Ashamed. Does the Lord have your heart? You know, uh, he told, in Acts chapter 8, they told Simon, he said, your heart's not right with God. That would have been hard to hear. Is your heart right with God? 
Have you said to him, Lord, take my heart. Use me for your glory. Take my heart. Mold me how you would have me be for your name's sake. We're going to have a word of invitation. Bow your heads. I don't know how it's conducted here, but we're starting on this week of camp. And God's going to be speaking to hearts. He wants to speak to your heart. Let me tell you something about God and the heart. When God starts speaking to the heart, he can tell you clearly what he wants of you. You know in your heart what you have not gotten right. You know it. And he's going to woo you, but he won't stop. You know, when God saved me, I was uh, had worked all day and got on a bus and went to my, a place where my dad was preaching, Willow Springs, Willow Springs Baptist Church. We went on a bus out there. And I had heard the gospel so many times how Jesus Christ died for my sins on Calvary's cross. <clears throat> how he rose again the third day for my justification. <clears throat> And how he was willing to grant me forgiveness of all my sins. Isn't that amazing? And receive me into his home and his family. Make me his. But I resisted. I, I remember that I stand in and holding on to the pew on the second row from the front, left hand side. It's a little wood frame country church. But I felt like that when God spoke to me, he told me I was not ready. He told me that I needed to be born again. Even though I was teaching Sunday school, fifth grade boys, <coughs> I was a good boy. I, I, I never brought shame on my family. I, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't carousing. I wasn't doing any of those things. But he spoke to me and he told me that I needed to be saved and born again. That I was corrupt from within that what he wanted to deal was with my sin nature. That's what he wanted to deal with. Oh, I shook. I, I thought, I looked around. I remember looking around. I thought the whole building was shaking. <laughs> That's how bad it was. I mean, while I left that night on the bus, I was, oh, man. Tried to work the next day, and I couldn't work the next day. The Lord had told me what he wanted of me. And uh, that night, on uh, Wednesday night, I, uh, that was a Tuesday night, Wednesday, and the next night, we burned trash and steel barrels behind the house. Anybody ever done that? I guess you all have. <clears throat> well, down inside of there, there was maggots and worms and nastiness, and it stunk to high heaven. And I fell before those drums, and I said, uh, that's who I am, Lord. I'm, I'm all I'm pretty on the outside. I never missed anything at church. But on the inside, I was dead man's bones. I was corrupt. I was filthy in my heart. And I need you to save me, oh God. That moment instantaneously if not faster he gave me peace I felt him take me in I felt him take he, take me in because you know what he had he was dealing with my heart he wanted to purify me from within without and he did. I was saved that night. Went to church next Sunday. Told the pastor I'm going to be baptized today if possible. It was my father. He said, Dennis? And I said, yes, sir. I've trusted Christ as my Savior. Listen, I don't know how God's dealing with your heart today. But you're not going to have a heart for missions. 
unless you have a clean heart before God. You're not going to have a heart for giving and going, and you're not going to have that courage for the regions beyond if you don't have your heart, if you don't have your heart. If he's got your heart, he's got everything. If he's got your heart, he's got your pocketbook. He's got your heart. He's got, he's got your family. He's got everything. He's, he's got every, if he's got your heart. Because he wanted David because he was a man after his own heart. What song are we going to sing? 497. Let's stand. And let's have a word of prayer right now. Father God in heaven, how we need thee, how we love thee. I pray, Father, that you'd bless this sweet congregation of people. You know I love them, Lord. I've loved them through the word this, this morning. And so I, I pray, Father, that you, and only you can know the heart of each and every individual. So I pray that every one of us would obey God this morning. And that we would glorify him and that we'd give him our heart however he might choose to use it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we sing, Pastor, would you come? this morning has been give me thy heart that's the lord's call to us first in salvation god calls every single person to himself and if there's a soul that's here today that does not know the forgiveness of sins that's found in christ then that's the primary and first call to your life give the lord your heart submit and surrender to him and then the opening text that we read in um in the scriptures was David, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. The next verse of this song really reflects that. And I hope that we can sing this from our hearts, those that have submitted to the Lord and have given him your heart. Let's make sure that we are fully engaged in performing all his will. Let's sing verse number three. <clears throat> Take my life and make it holy thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take Oh, my. 
right there, but what a wonderful start um, to our theme as we consider evangelism and missions this week, the need to submit our hearts to the Lord. If there's anything with which the Lord is dealing with you and you need some further counsel, if you want more understanding about how to be saved, and I invite you to please come and talk to me after the service. I'd be happy to, to take you to God's word and to spend some time showing you plainly how to be saved. And if there's some area of submission to the Lord, um, would you just yield to him? That's the way to have a, a wonderful week as well as a wonderful life is just to submit to the Lord right up front and he'll be able to, um, to show you exactly what he wants. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Thank you so much for, um, for reverencing God's word, for paying attention this morning. Thank you um, for the spoken word today. We'll be dismissed and then uh, look forward to a further time of fellowship with you folks. Remember 3.30 this afternoon is the show up time out at the camp. And so um, we'll look forward to seeing you out there, getting you checked in, and then very much look forward to uh, another time of worship together this evening. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks today for your kindness to us. We see in your word that you call us to submit everything to you. Uh, we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. I pray that Every heart would be fully submitted to you here today. That you would be able to shape us and do exactly what you want with us. And that we may truly perform all your will because we've submitted our hearts to you. Thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your kindness in reaching down to my life, leading me to an understanding of the truth so that my life could count for something for you. Please dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.